uh, if you can first talk about, um, we, and we've talked about it a lot, the, mis the basic misconception that diabetes is caused by sugar, that instead it is fat that is the root cause of the issue. Um, please, you know much more about it than I, so tell me where I'm right and where I'm wrong. Yeah, so, so first of all, to clarify, I definitely didn't head up the study. It was headed up by John Kelly, who was the founding uh, president of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. I was the lead dietitian and pretty much created the program. Ah. Uh, so we had five overlapping cohorts. I, I created the program so the you know, exactly what we were going to be doing with our participants and, and our results were really quite stellar. So we're, it's, it's, uh, it was a, just a wonderful project to be involved with. It was in the Marshall Islands, which are kind of halfway between Hawaii and Australia and a very, very remote islands with a small population, uh, almost impossible to have a control group because everybody knows everybody and, and uh, so they can influence one another a lot. Uh, but it is a, just a beautiful uh, group of people and we, I really enjoyed working with them. Uh, but, you know, diabetes is really and truly, we talk about fat, we talk about sugar, uh, they they are both implicated in, in all honesty and because what diabetes is about is it's about overconsumption. So we see people in the world who eat, you know, 50% of their calories from fat, they get no diabetes. Uh, so you would look, they're almost non-existent. For example, the Marshallese people, uh, so people of the Marshall Islands, um, you know, 80 years ago had no type 2 diabetes. Their diet was 60% coconut, uh, which it may be a shock to you, but, but basically what we see is we see people who remain lean, who are eating whole unprocessed foods. So the foods basically as they're grown, they're eating fish and plants is what they were eating back then. But if they're eating, you know, a lot of plants particularly, they're, and they don't get overweight, they don't get type 2 diabetes. We see people in the blue zones who have very, very low rates of diabetes tr eating their traditional diets. Well, there's a blue zone called Okinawa that's about 6 to 10% of calories from fat. There's another blue zone called Ikaria, Greece. They eat 40 to 50% of calories from fat. They don't get diabetes when they're eating their traditional diet. So that to clarify is really important. It's not so much the percentage of calories from various macronutrients that really matters, it's the source of those macronutrients. When fat is packaged in whole foods like nuts and seeds and avocados and even coconut, it, you know, it, it's, it's not so harmful to health. When sugars are packaged in fruits and vegetables, Sugars aren't so harmful to health, but when you extract fat and concentrate it and you extract sugars and concentrate and you create all of these processed foods that are literally, they are designed to, to, to mess up our appetite control systems, to, to make us hit this kind of bliss point where they, we can't stop eating, uh, that's when uh, we end up overeating. And whether the calories are coming from fat or sugar, or, you know, whatever the calories are coming from, when you overeat and you gain a lot of weight, your body can't, um, you know, it can't cope with all the extra calories. And what happens is, so let's say you're eating, um, you know, a lot of uh, fructose, for example, that's been added to food. It, it goes to your liver to get converted into some storage form unless, you know, if, I mean, if you didn't overeat and you could use those calories, you could use the calories, but you, it, when you're overeating, you have to store them. And what ends up happening is that fat gets shuttled into our, you know, adipose tissue. But quite often, we can't shuttle it fast enough, so the body has to do something with it. And what ends up happening is, is it gets stored in the liver um, as, as fat, and it gets stored in the pancreas as fat, and it gets stored in the heart, and it gets stored in the, in the muscle tissue as intramyocellular lipids. So, but the, the, the lipids that are the most problematic are those in the pancreas and the liver. Uh, 
Uh, so th when you have a liver that's a, that's a fat storage depot, uh, you become very insulin resistant. And so insulin resistant is really the name of the game. And when you have a pancreas that has even a small percentage of, of, of fat in the pancreas, it destroys your beta cells. And so your pancreas can't be putting out insulin the way it should be putting out insulin. So these are, you know, really critical pieces of the diabetes puzzle. So some people say, oh, you need to eat a less than 10% fat diet. Uh, you need to be really, really rigid on, on, you know, getting rid of the oils and all of that. But really what's most important is that you're eating whole foods <laughs> and you're not overeating that you're you're you get you're uh, lowering your body uh, fat stores so that you get rid of the fat in your liver and the fat in your pancreas and the fat in i mean obviously your muscle tissue needs some fat because your intramyocellular lipids the people that have the highest levels of intramyocellular lipids are athletes um, uh, intramyocellular lipids are, are actually energy reserves. They're organelles that provide energy that you need when you're when you're active. Now uh, we hear, you know, Neil Barnard, for example, talking about intramyocellular lipids being so problematic in diabetes, and they absolutely can be when you're eating really unhealthy fats. And the type of intramyocellular lipid, it, you end up with too much fat in those organelles, and it's bad fats, the fats that actually affect the fluidity of the cell membranes, and, and so it, it affects your insulin resistance and all of that. Uh, but it, it's a complicated story. It's not that simple. So diabetes is really a function of several drivers. Um, lipotoxicity. Lipo is a lipid and lipid is fat. And so lipotoxicity is essentially lipids or fats being stored in parts of the body where they really shouldn't be stored because they cause great harm in the liver, in the pancreas, in the heart, in the, you know, too much in the muscle tissue. So that's lipotoxicity. It's toxic to the body when you have lipids stored in those places. And then the second, uh, dysbiosis. Dysbiosis is really just a, um, you know, an, a, an unbalanced gut microflora. So the, we have all of these microbes that live in our intestinal tract. And for years, we didn't think much of them. We just thought they were you know, they would use up fiber and they were kind of like little parasites in our bodies. Uh, that nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, and, and there are some unhealthy gut microbes and there are some very healthy gut microbes. And sometimes the unhealthy take over and you don't have enough health, you don't have enough diversity, you don't have enough of the, the healthy microbes, you have too many of the unhealthy, whatever it is. But there's this balance that, that ends up not only being bad for your gastrointestinal system, it affects your insulin secretion, it affects your brain health, it affects your risk of inflammation and oxidative stress, it affects the production of, of things like short-chain fatty acids, which, increase, which can help to decrease your risk of cancer, so we don't get enough of them, we get increased cancer risk, it affects everything it's unbelievable how vital that microbiome in your gut is to your entire well-being and so yes when your you know your gut microbes are out of whack it's a problem and the way that you your gut microbiome is is kept healthy is by feeding it healthy things and what it needs is it needs prebiotics and you know because it's probiotics basically it needs food and so prebiotics come from various fibers various fermentable fibers in plant foods and so eating plants is absolutely critical to the gut microbiome and uh, and so the the third thing I mentioned is oxidative stress and oxidative stress again is a balance of these pro-oxidants versus the antioxidants in the diet. So a pro-oxidant would be something like heme iron from meat uh, can be a very strong pro-oxidant, whereas an antioxidant 
would be carotenoids or vitamin E from plant foods largely. And, and so we need a reasonable balance of those because when you get high levels of pro-oxidants and not enough antioxidants, you end up with what we call oxidative stress or free radical damage to your to your all of your body systems. And then the last one is inflammation. And this one most people know about, but but we when we think of inflammation, we think of, you know, you get a cut and it turns red and that's external inflammation. But you get this chronic low grade inflammation in your body where it, that affects um, it affects atherosclerosis because it allows different kinds of cells to get into your blood vessels that can really promote um, atherosclerosis and and the disease process but it affects every disease it affects insulin resistance it affects Alzheimer's disease it affects everything and so those are four big drivers of chronic disease and every single one of those drivers uh, we literally put a lid on by eating plant-based uh, because that's where the compounds the you know the, the the things that keep our gut microflora healthy the 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 the, uh, the you know the the various anti-inflammatory compounds and the antioxidants that's where they're concentrated is in colorful plant foods so a plant-based diet essentially minimizes the components of the diet that are most pathogenic and and maximizes the components that are most protective and that that's why eating plant-based it can can work its wonders and it really can it's phenomenal to see the changes in people's health when they move in this direction <laughs> 